how many times have it happened that you go into a supermarket and you are able to grab all of the items that you need in just five minutes. But what happens when you go at the billing counter? Sometimes the line is too long and you are just annoyed and you would probably leave all of the stuff and go to a different store, correct? And similar is the case when you might do online shopping as well. You add all of your items to your cart, but what happens at the checkout page? The website becomes so slow that your transaction does not succeed. In that scenario, you will close that website and you will try to go on to a different website to shop the same product, right? So this problem that we are addressing in system design, we call it load balancing. And in this particular video, we are going to talk exactly about that. Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. Load balancing is a very fundamental concept when it comes to system design. You are creating a model where you have all of these clients and they are interacting with these servers. Now you want all of these clients to be happy. Only then your app will be successful. Only then you will have a lot of views on your website. So you want to make sure that all of these clients are balanced and they get the service that they need. So before we talk more about it, let us do a quick recap about what all do we already know. Up to this point, we have discussed why system design is important and where would you get it in an interview process. We also understood what do you mean by horizontal scaling and what do you mean by vertical scaling and why both of them are important. We also established how will you communicate. We will use the client server architecture and we talked about some of its advantages and the challenges as well. As you might have already deciphered, load balancing effort is one of those challenges. And we are going to address specifically that in this video. All along the way, we were also able to relate everything to an example of a bookstore. That way, everything just sticks to your mind and you are able to relate it to real life examples. So once again, let us take back the example of our bookstore. And this time my bookstore is very big. It has a music library, it has digital books, it has physical books, it also has a cafe. So I will be expecting a lot of traffic in there. I had a server available and all of my clients were coming to get them serviced, right? Now, since my bookstore is big, what will happen is I will have a lot more customers coming in. And when I have so many customers, a single server can get overwhelmed. It could be possible that this server is unable to process all of these customers in time. And what will happen eventually? Eventually, it is possible that some of the customers will be unhappy and they will just leave the store. That is not what you want. So you want to address this issue. So what can you do? Either you can change your server, you can have an efficient person who is doing it, or there is one more possibility. Instead of having a single lane, you can have multiple lanes as well. And I'm pretty sure you have seen that in a supermarket. You will have multiple counters. So what does that do? In such a case, some of the people will go to a separate lane and some of the people will go to a separate lane. This way, you are able to reduce the stress of each of the server and all of your clients are happy and your store is successful again. Now, what happens when a new customer comes in? Let us say you are done with all your shopping and you want to go to the billing counter. You will choose, okay, this line is the shortest. So you come and you will stand in this line. This is the most natural thing to do. It is very unlikely that a line is so huge and then you come and you stand in this huge line over here. That usually does not happen. So what are we trying to do over here? We are trying to balance the load at each of the server. So this is called load balancing. This is what happens in a supermarket. What about a computer application and what do you do about system design? If you remember, our server looked something like this. It has its own database, its disk and a CPU. Going ahead in the series, what we're going to do is we are going to represent our server something like this. And this is a very generic diagram of a server. And you use these kind of diagrams to make up your entire architecture. 
when you're reading more about system design and exploring articles on the internet, you will find these kind of diagrams. So now what we have over here is I have my server and it is serving all the clients. Let us say there is some event going on, a sale or something. Then suddenly you will have a lot more clients who want to connect to the same server. It is the same scenario, right? This server will now get overwhelmed and the response time will slow down. Some of the customers might get unhappy and they can just leave your website, correct? So it is exactly the same problem. Can we apply the same solution to it? Yes, what you can do is instead of having your app deployed only on one server, you can deploy your app on multiple servers. Now these multiple servers are like multiple lanes and your clients could just connect to any of them. This way you are able to reduce the load on each of the server and all of your clients are happy. Now the problem arises when a new client comes in. In case of a supermarket, you were able to see that, okay, this line is the shortest and you could just join that line. But when you're on the internet, you cannot see the servers and you cannot see the clients. Also, you don't even know how many servers are available. So how do you decide which server to connect to? This is where the concept of a load balancer comes in and you define a load balancer using this symbol. This load balancer could be a hardware, it could be a software, or it could simply be a piece of code that decides that, okay, if a client comes, where should they go? Should they go to the first server? Should they go to the second server? Or should they go to the third server? And certainly there are multiple ways by which you can allot this client to any of these servers. Always remember that our end goal is that each of these servers should be balanced. So when this new client comes in, how can you make this connection? The most obvious way will be that you start off with the server that has the least number of requests, very similar to the supermarket situation. So this load balancer knows all of the information about each of the server and how many clients are connected. So when I have a client connected, this load balancer will take it and it will allot it to a server that had the least number of requests. And now it could be possible that another client comes in. Now this client can go to any of the server which has the least number of requests. So randomly it is possible that, okay, this client went to the first server. Now, as this time happens, it could be possible that server number one was able to finish all of these three clients. So they no longer exist. These clients have been served. Now, what will the load balancer do? Since there are new clients coming in, it will check, okay, I have a new server where I can allot the load and these new clients will get to server number one. Similarly, this process will go on and you could keep on allotting clients. So what is happening? This load balancer is making sure that all of the servers have balanced loads. And this kind of a scenario is usually efficient when each of your server is configured in the exact same way. The other way you can do load balancing is by round robin scheduling. Think like this. Let us say you have a lot of candies available and you want to distribute it to a lot of kids. So what do you do? You keep giving one candy to each student at a time. You will keep on repeating this process until you're out of candies. This ensures that all of the kids have equal number of candies, correct? So it is a very similar situation. I have all of these servers available and these are my clients. So by a round robin scheduling, what I can do is I can keep on allotting all of these clients one by one. So in a way, this is trying to keep the load balanced between each of the servers. There can be one tiny problem with this approach. Let us say that these two users, they had very tiny requests. They wanted to download an image. They did it and they're done. According to round robin scheduling method, for the next client, this next client will go to server number one and this next client will go to server number two. It is possible that this particular user is blocking the server. It could be possible that they're downloading a huge movie and all of these clients will get waiting. So sometimes the round robin scheduling method is not desirable. And to address that issue, 
what we do is we can also do a weighted round robin scheduling. In a weighted round robin scheduling method, we allot all of the clients based upon the server's capacity. So let us say I have this scenario set up, right? There is one catch though. This particular server is more efficient than the rest of the servers. This server is huge and can process more requests. So what could happen is instead of allotting all of the clients one by one, when it comes to the efficient server, you can allot them two clients and all of the servers one client at a time. So what we're doing is we are relying on the server's capacity and based upon that we are doing all of our load balancing because it is possible that this third particular server is able to serve all the customers quickly. So once again, we are doing weighted scheduling to maintain a balance between all of these servers. One more method that I want to discuss about load balancing is IP hashing. It is just a fancy term. All it means is that there could be some particular clients that are always connected to only one particular server. And you can try to think like this. Let us say I have a server in North America and then all of these users in yellow, they are in the North America region. So they will get the best service when they are connected to the server in North America, right? So when I'm scheduling all of my clients, what I will do is I will schedule one client to server one, other client to server three. But whenever I see a yellow client, I will allot them to server number two. So this way, once again, I'm making sure that all of my load is balanced. And you can think of it like this. If you go to a supermarket, you have seen that there are certain aisles where it says 10 items or less. So what are you doing? You are fixing certain type of client to certain type of a server. So only clients with 10 items or less can go to this particular counter. This is exactly how IP hashing works. One another scenario that you might have also seen is the concept of free version and a premium version. And you have seen that apps will boast that if you take a premium subscription, you will be served faster. So over there, they apply the concept of load balancing. So what they will do is for premium users, they will have a dedicated server. So if you have any other user, they will get randomly assigned to any of the other servers that are available. But for premium users, they will have a dedicated line and they will only allot them to that premium server. So all of these are just general examples about how a load balancer works and how does it distribute the load. This is not an exhaustive list. You can have any number of methods or you can even develop an algorithm of your own to distribute these loads. As with any concept, when you are taking up a new component, such as a load balancer, it will have its benefits and its disadvantages as well. So talking about its benefits, what did we do? We had a system that looked something like this, where everyone was connecting to the same server to a system where you have multiple servers and all of your traffic is distributed. The prime advantage you get is that all of your traffic is now working in parallel and everyone is happy. Your load got distributed, right? This is not the only advantage though. Let us say I have my system set up like this. Now, suddenly a lot more customers starts to come in. This particular model, it allows you to scale up your system as well. If you have so many users coming in, what you can do is you can deploy your app to one more server as well. So what just happened? I scaled up my system and now once again, I can start allotting all of my users to balance my load effectively. So this is all the advantage that I'm getting because of a load balancer. And this does not end over here. Having a load balancer allows you to have high availability as well. It simply means that let us say one of your server goes down. You still want the service to be accessible, right? So this load balancer will once again come in play. And what it will do is it will take all the clients that were connecting to this faulty server and it will allot them to these different servers. So yes, your service time might go down, but your service did not end. Your clients can still connect and they will be served. 
So once again, it is still better than nothing, right? So these are all the good things that come with a having a load balancer in place. Now talking about some of its disadvantages. You see this entire system that we have set up and all of the functionalities that we have. This system is clearly not easy to design, right? It becomes very, very complex and you have to handle all of these scenarios as well. What if a server goes down? What if there is a lot of traffic? What if a client is taking up so much time? What if a client is unresponsive? So this load balancer has to manage all of it and writing the code for it, it is not easy. Managing all of these servers in parallel is also very complex. So this is one prime disadvantage. The other disadvantage is that this load balancer itself, this becomes a single point of failure. Because think about it, if this load balancer goes down, then these clients cannot even connect to the servers, right? let alone having a distributed system. So this load balancer becomes your single bottleneck and your entire system could crash. So it is always essential to keep this in mind. And naturally, the third parameter is always security. You want to make sure that you have all the security protocols in place when you're implementing a load balancer. Because if this load balancer gets compromised, then you can divert all of your traffic to just one server. And then this server can get overwhelmed and it can go down. So naturally what will happen? This will go down, this will go down, and then this will go down. So your entire system once again crashed. So in a nutshell, a load balancer is very, very essential for a design where you are scaling up to a lot of users, but it comes with all of its caveats as well. These are some of the things that you must keep in mind when considering using a load balancer. Don't worry about it if it does not make sense right now. You will understand it even more when you are actually making all of these system design diagrams. Then you will have a lot more questions. So while going throughout the video, did you face any problems or have you seen any other real life examples? What kind of solutions have you seen? Do you know about any other methods by which you can balance load amongst all of these servers? Tell me everything in the comment section below and I would love to discuss all of it with you. Also, it will become a very good collection whenever you are revisiting this video. As a reminder, if you found this video helpful, please do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This keeps me motivated and I can make more such content. Also, a huge shout out to all the members who support my channel. You guys really keep me going. And as a member, you do get priority reply to your comments and early access to new videos as well. So that is something which is really, really cool. So stay tuned for my next video. Until then, see ya.